couple of announcements of how we are going to proceed uh, in the next uh, 22 hours. Uh, so uh, now we are going to have a, a talk uh, following the usual uh, question discussion. And then after that, we are going to have a um, presentation of the groups. So we have, uh, in my knowledge, five groups because one disappeared. Also four and five? They are separate. OK, so we have five groups. Um, and so around three, from three to four, we are going to have this presentation of the groups. And then uh, uh, tomorrow uh, morning, we'll uh, reconvene here at nine. We are going to have a sort of uh, summary synthesis uh, uh, part uh, plus discussion. And uh, after the coffee break, uh, we are going to have uh, another discussion on how to move forward. So uh, when Matteo started the introduction to this uh, <coughs> workshop, uh, he mentioned to the fact that we uh, can and want to organize uh, something for uh, for uh, future year. So you want to say something? And the synthesis after? No. OK, and just finish. OK, so, OK. So this is the plan for the next 20 hours. So <laughs> then at now we need to convene. We have a, a discussion including a, a synthesis and a discussion including on how to move forward in terms of uh, workshop. And then tomorrow morning. And then uh, at coffee break, everyone is free to do whatever he or she wants. OK, so with that, I leave the. OK. Uh, we have the intervention of uh, Andrea Brandolini. Andrea Brandolini is an economist. He's uh, duty head of economics and statistics department of the Bank of Italy. Bank of Italy the, is the central bank of uh, the Republic of Italy. It has a very important uh, research group, research department. Andrea is a scholar of inequalities and poverty and has taken uh, uh, part in important government commissions for the measurement of uh, absolute poverty, poverty, and well-being. Thanks, Andrea, for being here with uh, us. The floor is up to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so many thanks for the invitation. It's a good pleasure to be here. Uh, just before starting, let me answer the question that some of you could ask, but why an economist from a central bank is interested in equality? Well, I've been studying inequality for 30 years at the Bank of Italy, and, uh, and I was asked to do that by the bank. So it was my interest also, but uh, that because the Bank of Italy has a very large uh, research department, uh, much larger than many, traditionally, much larger than in other countries, in, in, the, in the advanced economies at least. I don't know less about the other economies. And, uh, and so we have always devoted the, great attention to issues uh, uh, concerned with inequality or more generally distribution of income and distribution of wealth. The Bank of Italy has a survey that has been running for uh, 60 years, since uh, the early 60s, about household income and wealth. Uh, it is a sample survey among households, and it is one of the longest, uh, long -running survey, the longest running surveys in the world. So just a note of, of background. Now, I understand that most of you if not all of you are uh, uh, very mathematically oriented, very expert of complex systems and so on. Uh, my talk will be uh, entirely non-mathematical, uh, so I hope that you, you, you can understand what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm not too easy for you. And uh, I decided to have a general talk about uh, inequalities the, the title is very ambitious, uh, but I will try to convey you the idea of what we know about inequalities uh, uh, and, and what are, uh, in my view, some of the critical issues, issues that will be, will, uh, let's say, condition or uh, affect <coughs> inequalities in the future. So, starting point is uh, the fact that uh, today, in this seminar, this workshop is an example, everybody is talking about inequalities. Uh, if I take uh, uh, economics, when I started to, uh, to, to work in economics, that was more than 30 years ago, it was a very 
a small field. Very few people were uh, working on inequalities. This is an example of the global and the uh, uh, attention of the public, public, pol public in the public debate to inequalities. That is uh, a report that uh, uh, Oxfam uh, releases every year uh, before the starting of the Davos meeting. This is the very last one published in January, last January, and it is uh, entitled Survival of the Richest. In chapter one, the inequality of explosion survival of the richest. And you see here a, a simple summary of the issues that are at stake. And that is the global uh, interest for, for the topic. Uh, as I was saying, it was not always the case. I don't know whether you can read, but this is a paper, the, the starting of a paper by Tony Atkinson. Tony Atkinson is one of the big names, probably the biggest name in economics uh, among the scholars uh, of uh, inequality, who passed away five years ago, unfortunately, sadly. And uh, Tony gave uh, this presidential address at the Royal Economic Society in uh, 1997. And he, he said, uh, it is time uh, well, uh, this okay, to give further impetus to the reincorporation of income distribution into the main body of economic analysis. That has always been a point of Tony. Uh, very few people care about economic inequalities at the time in economics. Not much happened in the following years until uh, the Great Recession. The Great Recession or the global uh, financial crisis, it is this different way of mentioning that event. It was in 2008 and nine. That is considered a turning point, in my view, uh, when we can look at inequalities. Not because inequalities started to grow then, as many people think, uh, simply because people realized uh, that uh, uh, something had been changing in, in the world. So Occupy Wall Street movement, and uh, the 1% uh, uh, entered into the public discussion. 1% uh, was not used before. This is an example of Martin Wolf, the uh, uh, financial chief financial commentator, economic commentator of the Financial Times. And uh, that is, that is uh, an article that he published in 2012, if I remember well. 20, yes, 2012. And uh, he had uh, uh, several pieces discussing the big challenges for the capitalist economic system. And uh, uh, one of the challenges was to deal with inequality. You can read by yourself. Well, maybe you can't, but it's not important. This is again the uh, Oxfam report, the, the first one published in uh, 2014. Uh, and that is Thomas Piketty, uh, Capital in the 21st Century. That is uh, a book that had a huge impact in the public debate. Thomas Piketty was uh, invited by Obama at the uh, White House and, uh, uh, and it helped also to raise the interest of economists for inequality. Last but not least about these examples, uh, this is a speech by um, Christine Lagarde when uh, she was uh, a managing director of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and uh, uh, when she was uh, uh, managing director, put inequality as one of the big priorities, well, dealing with inequalities, one of the big priorities for the economic community in the world. This is important from many points of view because uh, the IMF is, uh, by definition, the most conservative international organization when dealing with uh, uh, economic policy. So it is a change uh, of attitude that is, uh, that is important. So that was kind of background <coughs> for my discussion. Uh, you will tell me about the time. I, I warn you that I have many more slides than my time will allow to present you, so I'll try to be quick on some. Uh, but I would like to deal uh, briefly with uh, uh, global income inequality. Then I will uh, look at uh, the inequality explosion, that is the Oxfam terminology. Uh, how inequality changed uh, within advanced countries. Uh, sorry, but I'm not an expert of developing countries, so I will focus here on uh, some advanced countries. And then I will uh, uh, bring the discussion to some future developments, uh, uh, some conjectures about what can happen. That is to stimulate the debate with, with you. Uh, 
uh, one, if you want to ask questions, interrupt me without any problem. I mean, it's not a big problem. Now, global income distribution. The story here is relatively simple. That is uh, the uh, distribution function for income for the world as a whole. And you see, and, uh, and the size of the areas are proportional to the population in the country. And on the on horizontal axis, you have uh, uh, per capita income. And you can see uh, the red one is China. So uh, many people in China were close to this vertical line that is the poverty, the absolute poverty line. So that is in 1988. What happens? And then you have the richest country here, the developed countries. That is what happened. So you just, oops, sorry. Per tornare indietro, ah, qua. So that is what happened in uh, between 88 and uh, <coughs> 2011. That basically the story is that China, but also India and other Asian countries, down here, moved uh, rightwards. So there was a, a great increase of per, per, per capita income in, uh, in uh, the Asian countries uh, that broke many people uh, to the middle of the income, of the world income distribution. And what happened was uh, uh, reducing inequality because uh, people moved from the bottom towards the middle in uh, these Asian countries. You cannot see much here, but uh, for developing countries, there is still a, a part of, rel of relatively poor people here in developing countries that uh, didn't improve their incomes as uh, uh, it happened everywhere, elsewhere. So the result of this was a strong decline in uh, absolute poverty. Uh, we might discuss how it is computed later if you want, if you are interested. This is uh, what I would call a really heroic uh, chart because it starts uh, in uh, 1820. So we didn't have surveys in 1820. We have only uh, small uh, uh, sets of uh, information. Uh, and from that point of view, these numbers are heroic. But the trend is clear, and especially clear here when we have uh, many more data and many more reliable data uh, to appreciate the decline in, equality, in, uh, in uh, poverty. Uh, that uh, was for the world as a whole uh, in aggregate. But when you look at the distribution, you see the deduction in the share of population in poverty in South Asia and East Asia, uh, quite substantial. But the point is that there was little improvement in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that is the trend forecasted by the World Bank a couple of years ago during the COVID pandemia, uh, epidemic, sorry. Uh, and they forecasted an increase uh, because uh, the improvement in sub-Saharan Africa has been much slower than in, in, in Asia. Uh, and it is amplified by uh, the strong population growth of these countries. As a result, that is the trend of uh, uh, income inequality, again, taking a very long period. Uh, this is from a paper by Branko Milanovic, a very recent one. This is a Gini index. Uh, I, and I guess that you know what the Gini index is, but it is the most popular uh, index of inequality. And uh, uh, it uh, goes from zero to 100 when it is expressed in percent. Um, it is not entirely true that it, is, well, it can be negative, but forget about that. So uh, when it is uh, zero, you have perfect equality. When it is one or 100, it is a perfect inequality in the sense that one person has all the income and all the others have zero. So you have a continuous increase of inequality during the Industrial Revolution, then uh, some increase even here before the Second World War. The increase continued at a slower pace from 1950 till, let's say, late 90s, early 2000s, about here. And that is the period of uh, uh, the second globalization. Uh, but then it 
fell uh, quite substantially in the, the last period. So at the global level, world income, inequ uh, income inequality went down in the recent period. All this is due uh, to the converging of the growth of the economies of uh, essentially Asia or all emerging countries. So uh, it is a, what we call between country effect that dominates the within country effect. So the, the changes in the income distribution within country. <clears throat> that is, uh, well, I'll, yes, I did spend some time on this. This is the elephant curve that has become popular. Probably you have known about this. You have heard about this curve uh, before that was popularized by <coughs> Branko Milanovic. And that is uh, uh, the blue line. It is called elephant, of course, because of this shape. Uh, it is a different way of looking at what happened uh, to uh, the world income distribution. On the horizontal line, you have uh, the percentiles of the income distribution. And on the vertical line, you have the income increase for the blue line between 88 and 2008, and for the orange line between 2008 and 2018. Uh, what you can see is here that the improvement, the increase of income was quite substantial here, and especially at the middle of the income distribution. And again, this is the effect of the improvement in Asia. Then you have a very small uh, increase in this area here, that is uh, uh, 80 to 90 percent, uh, so 80 to 90 percentile of the income distribution. And that is uh, the this area here is mostly uh, comprising the bottom of the income distribution in rich countries. Uh, so let's say the poorest in, in the UK, US, Europe, uh, uh, in general. And uh, and here you have the very rich that are in rich countries, but not only in rich countries. So this typical shape is what uh, uh, we discussed until uh, uh, the Great Recession and uh, soon after, after the recession. But the more recent movement has been this one, so uh, a continuous increase in the incomes in emerging countries, and even at the top, uh, there has been a slowdown in income growth. These are, again, estimates by Branko Milanovic. So to put uh, in a simple way, and using the expression that uh, François Bourguignon uh, put in his book uh, uh, on, on these issues, uh, what we have seen is the last the quotation here. Uh, what we have seen has been a, an internalization of global inequality. Uh, as nicely put by Francois, inequality between Americans and Chinese would be partly replaced by more inequality between the rich and the poor in America and China. So some of the inequality that we saw at the global level became a problem of inequality within each country. We said the countries, in terms of per capita income, getting closer to each other. But the story, as I've shown, seems to change after 2008. Now, that is the global picture. So to tell you what has happened and... Uh, now, what can we say uh, about uh, single countries? Now, I will show you some charts for, uh, I think, eight or ten countries, uh, starting with the UK and the US. And uh, these charts allow me to uh, discuss a couple of methodological issues. I know methodology is boring, uh, but it is criti critical, well, it is always critical, but it is critical when you discuss uh, inequality because you have to understand a number of issues that I will explain better later. But in this, in this chart, uh, you see uh, black lines and uh, uh, orange lines. The difference is that the black lines are Gini coefficients, was the measure I was telling before, and the Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality taking into account the incomes, in this case the incomes or the wealth or whatever it is available, of everybody in the society. So the Gini measures the distance of my income from Matteo's income 
and from uh, uh, Giovanni incomes and all the others and take uh, the average of, of this difference. This is the intuition. The other measure here is the share of the top 1%. So you rank all people by increasing income and you measure the share of income that is uh, received by the top 1%, so the richest people in, uh, in, uh, in the society. The other difference, so the top, top 1%, oops, sorry, the top 1% share uh, is the measure that was popularized by, uh, by Thomas Piketty and co-authors. Uh, they built a huge uh, data set for, for many countries. There are a second difference between the two lines because the top 1% usually is uh, computed not for disposable income, uh, but for uh, uh, the taxpayers. So it is a different concept of uh, income receiver. Uh, I will explain that later. Uh, and final warning is that you, will, you have uh, two different lines, two different black lines in, for, for, for the, the UK, but a, a, and three lines for the US. And the difference between these lines uh, is that they come from different sources. So one important warning is that uh, there are many sources of income distribution data and they don't tell you the same story. In the selection of the data I'm going to present, I focused on the surveys that allow me to look at changes, uh, trends within countries. So they are not comparable across countries, but uh, relatively uh, reliable for comparison over time within countries. Now, this for the methodological part. Uh, I start with the UK and the US because uh, these are the two countries uh, in the rich world that uh, experienced first a big increase in uh, income inequality. The increase in income inequality starts uh, between the late 70s and early 80s, and it coincides uh, with uh, the uh, Reagan administrations in the US and the Thatcher government in the UK. Uh, there is a connection between the two, uh, and there is also some causality because some of the measures that were uh, taken by uh, the two administrations went in the direction of uh, uh, not uh, contrasting the uh, increasing inequality in market incomes, so incomes earned in, in the market uh, uh, through wages, uh, uh, self-employment income, and, and profits. Uh, so, yes? No, 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 no. Ah, okay. So you add up the incomes of all taxpayers, and uh, you rank the taxpayers, you select the top 1%, so in a country uh, with uh, 100 people, it is uh, one person, and uh, you take the ratio of the income of those top 1% to the total income. Okay, so it is uh, just a share of income. So, and it is measured on the vertical axis, so for example, in the US, uh, it is around 20% now. That means that the re richest 1% of the population earn 20% uh, of the total income, okay? And of course, they, move, they tend to move often together, but not exactly, and, uh, and uh, they can move in different ways in some countries and some period. <coughs> so UK <coughs> and the US experience uh, these changes, uh, uh, this, uh, change, this reversal of uh, the previous trend from the Second World War uh, in the same uh, period. Uh, but then uh, they moved differently. If you look, uh, uh, this is UK, you see from uh, basically uh, early nine, nine, the early 90s uh, onwards, there are oscillations of the Gini index, but it is essentially a flat, flat trend. And even here, big oscillations, but there is a, not a substantial increase. <coughs> whereas in, whereas in, uh, in uh, the US, uh, you have a, a much, more, uh, much more steady increase in inequality according to all measures. You see these spikes in the American, in the US series here. Uh, these spikes uh, are due to the fact that this income concept in, includes uh, uh, capital gains. 
Capital gains are very concentrated in the top of the distribution. And when you include, include the capital gains, so capital gains are the gains that you realized on your assets, uh, and, but you realize, not potential, realize capital gains. And it happens often because of changes in legislation. So in a year, you realize your capital gains by, uh, and you declare those incomes. And that creates spikes in, in, in the distribution, like this one or the one that we will see for Sweden. So that is the case of the two Anglo-Saxon countries, often put together. Here we consider Sweden and Finland, two countries that are at the other extreme, probably among the uh, less unequal country in the world in terms of income distribution. But uh, uh, still, both Sweden and Finland experienced a substantial increase in income inequality. But starting later, about 10 years later than uh, UK and US. Uh, so from this point of view, we see an explosion of income inequality because for those four countries, we see a, a substantial increase in inequality, even if the timing is different and also, uh, also the trends, because if you take Finland again, uh, not much change in the last 20 years. So the, the increase was concentrated here. And uh, whereas for Sweden, the increase tended to be uh, to, to, to last long. Canada and Netherlands are other two countries. And here the story starts to change a bit. If you take Canada, you see there has been an increase in inequality, mostly concentrated in, uh, in the 90s, then flat, and then a decline. So if we take the Gini index, basically income inequality in Canada in 2020 is back to the levels of uh, the late, late 70s. So no explosion. You see some explosion in the top 1% share uh, <coughs> of income. Netherlands, you have a story that is similar. You have an increase in inequality in, uh, in, uh, just before uh, 1990. If you look at the Gini index, and then not much change. If you look at the top 1% share, you see not much change uh, since uh, the 1980s, but a decline before. So a uh, story that is slightly different from what, what we saw before. Again, France and Germany. Germany very much concentrated increase in inequality in the early 2000s. Uh, that tend to coincide what, uh, with the so-called Hartz reform in the labor market for the German speakers. Uh, so it was a flexibilization of the labor market and also many jobs uh, were distributed in that period. That is a period we associated, but then uh, not much happened afterwards. And France, again, you cannot see much big increase in uh, inequality. Uh, some variations, but not substantial increase. Quickly, Italy and Spain. Uh, in Italy, we saw an increase in inequality in the early 90s, up to 1993, essentially, uh, from the lowest level probably reached in the early 80s. And not much change if I would consider the uh, Gini index uh, since 93, 95. Uh, some fluctuations, <laughs> but not <coughs> a substantial increase. The story is very different if you look at the top 1% share. Uh, but that is a very different concept. And uh, uh, well, I don't want to spend the time in discussing how this uh, line is concentrated. I have some uh, 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 some reluctance to take it face value because of the main imputation, but uh, here the story is slightly different because we have a continuous increase in inequality, but it's not supported from the information we have from uh, sample surveys. Uh, for Spain, it is interesting that is a, uh, you see a big increase during the Great Recession, but then inequalities back to previous levels. So again, also in Spain, we cannot see from these numbers a, a big explosion of inequality. Now, so far... I have a question. Yes, please. Um, because among different countries, there are many, for example, very different uh, uh, tax systems. Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, but also within countries. Also within countries. Because uh, we okay. come back to that. So, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and also, in Italy, the system, I think, is strongly dominated. I mean, it could be affected by that economy. And uh, I, I suppose. Uh, do, you have, do you have any idea 
Uh, well, we, we should go in the analysis more deeply in the analysis country by country. Uh, of course, uh, the, the underground economy is relevant in Italy, must, much less relevant in uh, Nordic countries. Even if, uh, even in those cases, there are examples of underground economy, but it is not a, as big as in Italy. It is a relevant issue in, uh, in uh, developing countries, of course, and the informal economy. Uh, I can tell you that in, uh, in uh, the Italian data, that are based on uh, the sample surveys collected by the Bank of Italy or the uh, silk data collected by Istat, uh, people are asked about the, what, let's say, the take-home income. So, uh, uh, for the self-employed, uh, and uh, we did some exercise, and we found that uh, uh, we could capture some of uh, the underground uh, economy workers because they declared, declared uh, us their income. We didn't ask whether it was regular or not, but we asked also for information about so social security contributions. So they had zero social security contributions. So we guessed that those persons had a, a, a work, a, a, an occupation in, in, a, uh, in the labor market uh, that was not regular. So it was in, in um, So the impression, and, and we did other studies, so our impression is that for Italy we capture some of the underground economy in the income distribution. Of course, not all, and uh, of course the issue is tax evasion, but the big issue for a sample survey is uh, uh, how we, you can capture the top of the income distribution. Because uh, you have, if income is concentrated, you, cannot, you, you don't select the rich people in the sample simply because uh, they, don't, uh, they are not selected randomly, or uh, even more worryingly, uh, they do not answer. But, I mean, we could spend a lot of time discussing this issue. Coming to the first part of your question, I think that uh, the country-specific aspects about taxation, welfare system, functioning of the labor market is crucial to understand uh, inequality. And sometimes neglected when people think about big forces like globalization and technology changes everything, uh, true, but you have to put in the right context. But we'll come to that later. <clears throat> These are uh, uh, USA and France again, top 1%, but here I'm comparing income and wealth. So, so far I've been talking about, uh, uh, about income. If you take wealth, the story might, might be different. It is not in the US, because uh, uh, the top 1%, this is income and this is wealth. That is the dynamic of the top 1% share, and you see that different levels, wealth is much more concentrated than income, but uh, uh, the shape is very similar, so the temporal changes are very similar. This is not the case in, in France, where you have very little change, as we saw before, in income, uh, but you have an increase in uh, wealth inequality uh, since uh, uh, the, the, the late 80s, or the 80s. Uh, so this is important because the perception of, my, of, the, of people and, and, the, and the issue at, in the debate can be wealth versus inequality. So it matters. So let me summarize some of the things that I want, wanted to. Yes. No, these are shares. So that means that, uh, well, because uh, uh, you can have uh, that the, the income, let me try to find an example. Uh, you can have a more equal distribution of wealth, and that is what is captured by this part here. So the people, in the top 1% of wealth, uh, reduces their share in total wealth, but the rest, but But incomes that were earned, because incomes are not only earned through wealth. They are earned through working in the labor market, transfer, and so on. So you could have uh, reduced, uh, you, you can conceive to reduce the concentration of wealth, and part of the uh, incomes that uh, you 
part of I'm trying to find a, a simple example. Suppose that you tax wells and you use tax to uh, redistribute uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the poorest people, then that policy uh, reduces the distribution of income or uh, uh, leave the, the distribution of income unchanged if it compensates other changes, uh, while it uh, declines uh, the inequality of wealth. I'm, I'm, and I understand that I'm not convincing you, but we should go through the algebra. It depends, I mean, because wealth is a stock. So wealth is what you have at a certain point in time. Then on wealth you can earn uh, returns, and that become part of, uh, uh, part of income and uh, goes there. But this redistribution, that is uh, only the share of the top 1%. That, for example, could go uh, to people that are in the top 10%. So it could be the distribution at the top of the wealth distribution, for example. Uh, so it, it can happen. It happened, because these are true numbers. Uh, the mechanism that can allow that uh, must be investigated looking at the single numbers. So. And the sense that it is not a totally satisfactory answer, but uh, so uh, what about this brief excursus uh, about long-run inequality changes? Uh, the first is that the inequality index matter because uh, the story is not always the same if you look at the Gini index or the top income share. And they would be different using other inequality measures. There is a full battery of inequality measures. Then it matters the income definition, and I will spend one minute later. Income versus wealth, as I said, and uh, the time horizon. Uh, choice which income. Now, even income is uh, uh, not a single concept. You can uh, think of, uh, you can think of uh, wages and salaries, what you earn in the labor market. You can think of labor earnings, including the earnings of the self-employed. Uh, market income is what you earn in the market, meaning labor incomes and profits and interest, but not transfers. And disposable income is what you can spend uh, in consumption goods and services uh, after transfers and after taxation. So it's... Uh, so these are different concepts of income that are used. Uh, and then uh, there are many other issues. Uh, I mentioned capital gains, but uh, you have also the issue about uh, imputed rents. So if you own your own uh, housing house, how you do, do you treat uh, the implicit income for that house in your income? Or in-kind benefits, so education, health. Uh, uh, so these are in-kind uh, transfers provided by uh, by the state in, in uh, most countries. Uh, so, now I don't have much time. Uh, let me go, okay, uh, let me jump this part here. Let me just show some numbers because this helps to understand what I have, I'm telling you. So when I, I measure the Gini index, here Gini index measured uh, using the same data uh, the Bank of Italy's survey uh, for uh, 2016. The first line, the first uh, uh, line in the, in the first bar in the chart uh, is uh, the Gini index, 20.7%. For monthly earnings, so it is uh, what you earn every month, if you are a full-time employee, and for the age group, uh, 1564, okay? Then the second bar is uh, monthly earnings, but now I change the population. I include uh, not only uh, full uh, full time employees, but also the part time employees in the same age class. And you see that inequality increases because uh, part time employees tend to be paid on average less than full time. But this is the monthly earning. The second, then uh, let's consider. Uh, also the self-employed, so uh, self-employed, and uh, consider yearly labor earnings. So we take the sum of all incomes earned in the labor market, and you can see, and also the self-employed, same age class, and uh, uh, you can see that inequality increases here, from here. Uh, the last step is this 
very high bar. This is a early labor earnings, so we sum all earnings in the labor market for all people in the household, in, uh, for a whole, for all the year. Uh, and, but we consider all people between 15 and 64 years. That means that we, to compute this Gini index, we give a zero income to everybody in this age class that has no job, no labor earnings. And you can see that uh, there is a substantial increase in inequality. So that is a way to show you that uh, we are talking about earnings in the labor market, so a relatively narrow concept of, of income. Uh, but moving from full-time employees uh, to include part-time, to include employees, to include also those with zero income, uh, you have a substantial change in, uh, in, in income. Then uh, when we go to at the household level, so that is what I showed you, uh, the charts I showed you before were for households, the Gini index were for households. So you put together all the incomes at the household level uh, on a yearly basis. Then you have, uh, uh, you, again, you focus on persons, 1564, or all persons, and you have, uh, uh, basically here, from here, inequality changes, because I take into account the income from other sources, including transfers, and I also take into account the fact that households have a, a redistributive role, because uh, uh, people earning money within the households transfer their money to the other component of the households. So that is uh, uh, the part of the redistribution due to the households, apart from transfers. So this is a, just to exemplify the point I was mentioning, why it is uh, uh, important to understand what, uh, what, uh, what is the concept of income you are using and the, of the population. So to coming to the point of, briefly to what that was raised before, uh, when we look at this U-shaped pattern of inequality, that is true for most countries, but not all, uh, but there are many differences in terms of timing and magnitude of the changes, and that is a, a way of, in my view, uh, of concluding that there are common forces, technology, demographics, uh, or, or, uh, or globalizations that uh, impact on the income distribution within each country, but there are important uh, national aspects in that distribution. So the tax benefit system are a primary example of that. So taxation and, and, and the welfare state. But also the regulation, for example, regulation in the labor market, more restrict or less restricted labor market. Uh, if I have to tell you a very few words uh, to summarize what are the interpretation of what has happened, there is a large literature now looking at the changes in income inequality in, uh, in advanced countries, uh, you see that the factors that are most, uh, that are stressed by most authors are more flexible labor markets have been uh, uh, factors that have increased inequality in the labor market, but also for household income. Ch taxation reforms, because taxation reforms have usually gone in the direction of reducing the top tax rates but also, if you remember Sweden and Finland, what happened there was uh, the dual income taxation, meaning that there was a different kind of taxation for labor incomes and transfers and capital income that went into the direction of increasing inequality. Uh, less generous welfare state is another, another part of the story, even if a welfare state remains still uh, very important. An interesting difference is that if you look at the literature for the US, relative to the literature for Europe, including UK, uh, that in the US, the emphasis is a lot on uh, the labor market or, or the markets, uh, much less emphasis on uh, changes in redistribution through the government. Whereas in Europe, we tend to, to, look, much, uh, to look much more to uh, changes in the welfare state, taxation, and so on, so redist public redistribution. <coughs> Now, quanto ho? Cinque minuti? No, I don't have more. To... Can I take five minutes more? Okay. Now, uh, let me move to uh, 
uh, some conjectures. The, here, I'm, I was talking freely before, but here, even more freely. Uh, so if we have to think at what's going to happen to income distributions, to inequality in income in, in the future, uh, which factors uh, should we consider? And I think that uh, uh, some are the same factors that we are behind the trends we have been discussing so far. Globalization, technological change, and uh, automation. Uh, demography, I didn't speak uh, much about the demography, but aging is certainly something that will change uh, greatly income distribution uh, and immigration. And also economic and social policy, how <coughs> they will be conceived in the future. So let me uh, spend some time on, on some of these issues. don't have time for all. Globalization. The, the discussion now on globalization uh, after the Great Recession, uh, but all, and even more after the COVID pandemic, uh, is that uh, the globalization was based uh, on what we call the global value chains. Global value chains increased a lot, became much more important. That means that uh, uh, the integration uh, in production across the world was much, uh, has become much stronger. Single bits are produced in different parts. Uh, the typical example is uh, the iPhone, where single uh, pieces of the iPhone are produced in different countries and only assembled uh, and eventually uh, branded in, in the US. So it is uh, not a US uh, thing, but it is made all, uh, all over the world. But that is true for, 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 many, for many goods. And we saw that the crisis with the microchips uh, uh, soon after the pandemic. Then uh, there was the Russian invasion of Ukraine that, Ukraine, that uh, complicated the story even further and uh, called into question what the principle of uh, peaceful coexistence. So now, uh, if you look at the debate on uh, international trade, it is dominated by words like reshoring, nearshoring, uh, to shorten global value chains. So offshoring was an important factor in globalization. Offshoring meant uh, to move production from factories in uh, advanced countries to countries, to, to uh, emerging countries. So some parts of the production were made in China instead of the US, and similarly for Europe. Now the debate is about uh, reshoring, so bringing back some of these productions to uh, the advanced countries, whether US or, or, or Europe. Uh, not much has happened so far. Big debate, but very few hard data tell us that uh, there has been a reshoring. There has been some kind of near-shoring, the fact that uh, now firms have a, a, a more diversified set of suppliers that are closer to the country. We have seen some deglobalization, so uh, the economist uses the term globalization, so slowing, slow globalization. Uh, and indeed, you see that there has been some uh, reduction in the last period, but not so substantial. Even if it is the first time since the Second World War that there has been a reduction. There is an index, uh, trade openness, very simple. It is just imports plus exports divided by uh, GDP uh, at the world level. Uh, so, so far, we have seen little. But still, the issue about uh, national security uh, and uh, the organization, the new organization of the global value chain is very open. My view is that uh, we are not going back uh, to the past, even if we can see some uh, reduction in globalization, unlike something terrible happens in the world. Uh, and in any case, <coughs> the deglobalization will be very, uh, we, very unlikely to uh, bring back uh, the productions to the old countries. If you take the example of Italy, Italy uh, between 1993 uh, and 2019 lost uh, one third of the industrial produ production in textile, clothing, and leather goods. So we are talking about a sector in which Italy was specialized and uh, about half of the occupation of the employment in the sector. This, are not, this is not going to be back after it has been moved to, to other countries, uh, because you have lost in capacity, productive capacity and so on. The other big issue is automation. 
maybe some of you or most of you know about the work by Brynolfsson and McAfee, uh, Race Against the Machine in 2011. And they had this uh, very terrible forecast about what uh, was going on uh, through automation. Uh, part of the story prob probably happened, part did not. Uh, there have been uh, some studies trying to understand how robot Internet of Things and artificial intelligence uh, can destroy a labor, human labor. Uh, this is from a work by, uh, by the OECD. And uh, this is for, for the OECD. These are countries, but if you take the OECD average, it's this one. And uh, you have that 40% uh, uh, of jobs have a high risk of being automated, the gray line. And 32% have a, a, a high probability high probability of being significantly modified by technical progress, that is the blue part. How do they estimate this number? Just uh, uh, dividing each job in the separate tasks uh, made in the job and uh, see whether these tasks can be uh, made by a computer or some automation uh, procedure. Uh, so this is just in the middle. We have much worse predictions and much better predictions. But still, the idea is that automation can reduce labor substantially. Uh, industrial robots is, is something that has been studied uh, intensively. And uh, there is an important and famous paper by Darren Semoglu with Restrepo. Darren Semoglu is a co-author of Jim Robinson that you heard uh, some days ago. Uh, Darren uh, studied a lot of these, these uh, aspects. They estimated that uh, in that period, 93-2007, in the US, for every installed robot, six jobs disappear. Sorry, I didn't give you the definition of robot. Robot is a, an automatically, automatically controlled, reprogrammable, multipurpose machine that do not need, uh, does not need a human operator. Uh, so according to the estimates by Asimoglu and Restrepo, six jobs disappear because of automation in the US, even if three on aggregate were created in other sectors uh, of the economy. But the net effect is minus three jobs. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, uh, has uh, done the same exercise for Italy, and uh, he found no significant effect on employment in Italy on a longer period. So, so far, automation has not destroyed jobs, even if Italy is the uh, six countries in the world in terms of the number of robots that have been installed. Uh, and also this uh, st study by Graz and Michaels for 17 OECD countries uh, does not find a big impact on jobs uh, of uh, automation and uh, actually finds positive effects on total factor of productivity and wages uh, in, uh, in, in these sectors. So I would say the, the evidence is mixed, uh, but there are many other papers. The evidence is mixed, but certainly uh, automation is something that can change uh, uh, <coughs> the functioning of the labor market, destroy jobs. But it is also a big opportunity if you take into account that we have a substantial change in demographics, aging population. If you have an aging population, a shrinking labor force, the possibility of replacing labor force with machines is something that we should look at uh, not uh, too negatively or not to worry. And indeed, another paper, as among the Strepo, find that automation is more pronounced in industries that rely more on middle-aged workers and uh, also in countries undergo undergoing faster aging. There are policy challenges uh, that have to do with uh, the skills and competence of people uh, and the distribution of scarce labor across people. Now, my time is over. So I cannot, think, I cannot talk about uh, demography and other aspects, but happy to take questions if you have, and if I'm allowed, other five minutes. Okay, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> we collect some questions and then uh, the yeah. collective answer, okay? Yes, yeah, so quickly, just a couple of keywords. One is uh, artificial intelligence, chat GPT. Is this the same as, you expect the same as automation? 
And second thing is, uh, during the pandemic, I think there were quite heavily economical interventions, transfer of, of, of uh, funds, state funds, to bail out different types of what, what is the consequence of effect of that on, on, on inequality or whether that teaches us anything about how to reduce it? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I find it useful always to distinguish between what we know and what we don't know, uh, especially when it comes to predicting the future. And on that basis, I feel a bit frustrated, I'll, I'll confess, when I hear 32% of jobs are at risk of automation. Why not 37? Why not 12? These things we have no idea, really. And so it's something that I, I often hear in, in talks, where we have overconfidence about predictions without even stating the amount of uncertainty we have. And so I apologize for this being a bit of a criticism, but it's something that has been frustrating to me. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I have only a question relating to clarification. In your second part of the of the talk before future develop, it was long run something. You you mentioned that to, uh, the case of the duality taxation of Sweden. And I would like only to know more about this phenomenon. And I have a second question that. Uh, Second question that is related also with automatization. And I would like to know your point of view regarding, do you think that in the future, uh, maybe the board will be replaced for, for, uh, yeah, for machine, the board of, of the organization and how we will be, will deal with all of these issues? Thanks a lot. Uh, very insightful. Um, I have a well, bit of a related question uh, about well, some of the figures we saw, which suggested actually that the increase in uh, income inequality has sort of flattened off in a number of uh, societies. Um, at the same time, you showed us also some figures showing that uh, arguably, say, the, the um, difference or disper dispersion in the degree to which jobs are precarious, people have a safe uh, job or not, only part-time employment, temporary employment, uh, um, well, may have increased. Um, so I wonder to what extent this uh, average uh, income inequality hides an increasing polarization in the security of labor and which risks come with that. Also. Okay. Uh, sorry, Andrea. Uh, uh, sorry, have you have you noted that there is a convergence in the level of a uh, top one percent for in uh, for uh, Italy, France, uh, Canada, and so on, but not for for US? Is it twelve percent? I don't know if this is a part of the story. Okay, I have also a question. Uh, do you think it is possible to um, fight inequalities uh, with the redistributive policies, um, or we have to work more on the predistributive assets? Okay, many thanks for, for the questions. Let me try to answer. <clears throat> You asked about artificial intelligence and the impact, uh, whether it is the same or not, uh, of automation. Well, there are different phenomena, of course. Uh, and uh, coming to the point that was raised, it's difficult to predict. And I'm, uh, and, uh, I'm very, uh, let's say, sympathetic with the criticism that it is difficult to predict uh, this phenomena. So, but I'll come back to that later. Artificial intelligence, I, I don't know enough to understand what could be the implication. And all this uh, debate of these days about chat GPT and the number of jobs that could be lost is based, that is really based on, uh, on 
let's say, fragile uh, understanding of the phenomenon. We don't know yet. My understanding is that one of the points that was made by Brynolfsson and McAfee in their book, and that was more than 10 years before, uh, ago, is that uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these uh, things could uh, uh, make, make change as a legal profession, for example, something that somebody would not think to be affected by some, I would think that humans are crucial in the legal profession. But still there is, there is a part of the work of legal professions that is going to the old uh, trials, to the old, all the, the, the corpus, the doctrinal corpus uh, of the laws and the, 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 the decisions of the judges uh, in trials that have to be inspected, and machines are much quicker. I mean, you can feed a, a, a machine with all this information, and that was a work that took ages, uh, well, not ages, but months of work before, and now can be done very quickly. And my understanding is that in the city uh, of London, where there are uh, important uh, uh, law companies, uh, this has made an, an impact, on the, especially on the number of young people that are hard, that we are typically hired for these works. So this is an example, I don't know enough, but uh, I guess that uh, artificial intelligence can change the work, the way we work. Uh, I tried chart GPT to understand, asking what policy should be uh, adopted to fight inflation, and the answer mm -hmm. was not, uh, not very satisfactory. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't use that with uh, my boss uh, at the Bank of Italy. <laughs> well, it is safe now. But it won't be later, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's difficult. I think it will it will have an impact in terms of probably some jobs will be lost, but some others will be created and uh, and and needed. And uh, you had a more specific question about uh, uh, transfers during the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, at least in advanced countries, we saw a huge uh, amount of money that was. Uh, uh, spent by governments to help uh, households and firms. It was very effective. Indeed, inequality didn't rise substantially in most countries. In some countries, U.S. is uh, an extreme example. Actually, in the U.S., uh, personal income, so the household income, uh, has increased as never before during the pandemic because of these uh, huge money transfers. Uh, and even inequality went down. In Italy, there was some rise in inequality. Uh, but it was a relatively uh, small rise, and uh, let's say that three quarters of the potential rise in inequality was uh, mitigated by the policies. The problem is that that was effectively it was the right thing to do then. The problem is that now we have to face the issue of the public debt that, has, that is much higher everywhere. Well, in Italy it was already higher, it is uh, even worse in Italy, but uh, that, that, that is something that will be inherited by future generations. Uh, so it should be our concern. Uh, you are a very skeptical point about prediction. I go back to that. As I told you, I'm very sympathetic, and I, present, I gave you that chart from LCD. Uh, there are many other studies producing completely different numbers. Uh, if you look uh, at the study, uh, you understand that there is some serious work behind that. They are not just number uh, guessed uh, and so on. But still you have a huge range uh, of potential uh, answers. Yet uh, it is worth doing that for two reasons. First, and I'm talking, I mean in institutions that uh, uh, is involved in policy making. And when, when you are in policy making, you need to have an answer. I mean, you have to need to understand what can happen. Uh, you can put uh, a huge confidence interval uh, around, uh, around uh, your number, uh, but still you need to make some educated guess about what, what's going to happen because you have to act and to take policy decisions. You cannot act saying, okay, I don't know, sorry, uh, but that is not our job. So from that point of view is, uh, uh, is important. And it is important also for the public debate. Uh, one thing that I didn't say, uh, automation, everything concerned with technological change, non is, is not something that comes from the heaven. It is not something, it is not exogenous, as we say in economics. It is endogenous. It is due to choices made by firms, made by people, made by government. 
So if you decide to uh, adopt one uh, uh, big uh, in technological innovation, you should take into account that there might be negative effects or uh, effects that you would not like to see. And indeed, Tony Atkinson, before dying, wrote a book called Inequality, What Can Be Done? And uh, he looked at uh, uh, different policies. The, he had uh, 12 different uh, uh, suggestions for policies. And the very first one was uh, to, con to look at technology not as a given, but as something that should go through a public debate, taking into account the human dimensions of, the, of technological adoption. Not to go back or not to adopt, but thinking about what are the implications and what you have to do, for example, in terms of compensations uh, for the losers when you adopt the technology. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, the nihilistic approach doesn't work. You have to be, in any case, positive. Very concerned, very, very careful about uh, the, the, the quality of the predictions and the problem and the uncertainty of the prediction. Uh, dual taxation. Dual taxation means uh, that uh, you have a taxation of uh, I cannot hear you, sorry. Um, my, I, I know the definition, dual taxation, but my question was regarding with the specific case that you mentioned regarding with Sweden, Switzerland. Sweden, Finland. And yes, and uh, I would like to know more about this this case. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you. So what's happened is that uh, this was a, because dual taxation is discussed in many other countries. It is discussed even, uh, it has been discussed in Italy. Dual taxation means that you go, uh, just for the for all the others, you tax labor income and the transfer with a progress, tra traditional progressive taxation, and you transfer income from capital with a flat tax. So if you have this, uh, you have uh, you create incentives to a certain extent to move from one category to the others because uh, the owners of uh, companies and corporations can uh, decide whether to pay themselves uh, a salary or a, a dividend. So. That op opens that way. Uh, but if you have some part of the incomes from capital are taxed with a flat rate, uh, that tends to increase inequality because uh, the assets are more concentrated at the top of the distribution. I don't know whether this answer. And that is what happened in Sweden and, and Finland. It is specific of those countries because those are the countries that adopted first. Well, not, not only those. I mean, Norway, Denmark. Uh, all Nordic countries moved, moved in that direction. Does this answer the, okay. Uh, you asked also something about automation, but I can't. Uh, yes. Well, in part, in part, I answered already. I don't think that the board will be ever substituted from. Uh, no, because simply because uh, the, the, there are capitalists, that will be uh, all the time, uh, unless we change the distribution of assets. I mean, automation is adopted. It's not, as I was saying, not uh, manna from the heavens. So, if you are the owner of a big company. Uh, you will remain owner of the big company, can use automation to reduce the labor force and to, but not to substitute yourself. So, that, but that is my view. I mean, that is a pure prediction, <laughs> pure guess in this case. Uh, polarization of labor and what happened in, in the labor market in Germany. Uh, the, the story is very complicated because in Germany, what happened is that uh, uh, the changes in the labor market in the early 2000s increased inequality but increased also employment. Uh, that helped the economy at the time. Uh, but then later there was no increase and indeed the last uh, analysis I've seen for Germany tend to think that uh, the 
labor market has improved a lot in terms of, uh, uh, of opportunities for people. Uh, but you probably what you meant is that there is an issue of quality of jobs uh, because mini jobs, uh, that is an important issue. So far we have been discussing uh, income or earnings. Uh, there are other dimensions. Uh, other dimensions, so for example, for automation is the amount of hours that people work. So I, have, uh, I had a quotation from Keynes that I didn't discuss, but the idea that in the future we will work less and less. And that is something that I see as a good thing, not a bad thing. So if we use properly new technologies, everybody can work uh, less and spend more time in what Keynes called the important things in life, uh, except for the work alcoholic. Uh, the precariousness of jobs as this bad dimension, that the jobs are bad in many different perspectives because they don't provide security in terms of income to people, security in terms of occupation. They tend to be, the people, most of them, they are not stepping stones for permanent jobs, but many people are framed in this situation of precarious jobs. They don't invest in their skills and the firms don't invest in their skills. So what, what is a, a, a characteristic of the labor contract can transform into a bad characteristics of the jobs and the skills and the quality of the person. So from that point of view, we should be very concerned about uh, uh, flexibility. Flexibility is not bad by definition. It is bad when it brings to this uh, segmentation of the labor market in some who are framed in that situation and some others that are not. Uh, that, is, uh, that, that is the point. Uh, Convergence, I don't know. I mean, the convergence, I, I don't think that you can make that point. Because the point is that the comparison of top 1% incomes uh, depends too much on the different tax systems in the countries. They are too different. So, uh, might be, I mean, one should spend a lot of time in understanding whether you can compare seriously across countries with those numbers. Even within countries, it, there are problems of changes in taxation. Uh, and in general, I don't, I don't believe in the iron laws of the, of, uh, the economy. I mean, uh, economy changes, uh, economies change, and uh, uh, so yes. No, there was the last question by, by Giovanni, and uh, predistribution, well, I don't like the term predistribution, so we are a sociologist, we like Jakob Hacker, but uh, uh, predistribution means nothing. I mean, redistribution is distribution after the distribution of primary income. Predistribution, it's a vague concept. The, com the point is that uh, uh, it is distribution in the market before redistribution by the government. Okay. Uh, and that depends on many different things. Depends on uh, the rules in the labor market. For example, whether unions can... Uh, uh, can uh, can have an effect on the distribution of wages, on a uh, big debate in the US about the minimum income, uh, minimum wage, uh, the impact of the minimum wage on the distribution. It depends on the distribution of uh, assets, so the ownership of firms and so on. Uh, it, is, it depends on many different aspects. You, I believe that uh, we should put much more uh, attention to, uh, to the distribution in the, uh, in, in the market, or market incomes. Uh, like Maurizio Franzini, I totally agree with that. It's not easy. Uh, we should understand what to do. But certainly, red redistribution is not the only, was I think in the last, uh, is not the only answer. And one big issue, and that, that is my last word, is how to distribute the uh, benefits of innovation. So who owns uh, robots and machines? I mean, the fact that somebody, oh, who, who, is, who gets the rents of uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, just the inventor, it is something that has been produced by many people, the, uh, the, 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 the academic and intellectual environment. That, that is a big debate. That, it started when, when, uh, when somebody proposed to, who was to propose that? Uh, Microsoft owner, uh, to, to tax uh, robots. Uh, but still, there is an issue. I mean, who is the owner of invention? <coughs> And, and, uh, and that is uh, related to pre-distribution, using your term. And I stop here.